Welcome again. We'll start with class 10 geography, uh, chapter 3 that deals with water resources. Let's start with a famous mariner saying that says, water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. And this saying uh, explains that if you are within the ocean, you have water all around you, but that is not fit for drinking. So most of the water that you have there is predominantly salty. Now, if you look onto the world scenario, you have one fourth section that is land and the remaining three fourth portion that is water. However, this water is a renewable source. Of this three fourth water, that 75% water that is present, 96.5% lies within the ocean bodies and we have merely 2.5% of the water which occurs as fresh water. Of this 2.5%, most of it, that is nearly 70%, is trapped as ice caps in the polar areas and only 30% occurs as groundwater. And this is the water that we are able to use. So, if we talk in terms of proportion, we have a very meager propor proportion of water that is available for human use. Again, it is estimated by 2025, there would be nearly 2, million, 2 billion people who would be without water if the scenario goes on at a similar pace. Now, India receives 4% of the global rain and ranks 133 in the water availability per person per year. India is however trying to improve its ranking by means of various water harvesting techniques that we will understand later in this class. Again, of the total renewable resources, India accounts for nearly 1897 square kilometers per annum. Now moving on, you have why you why do we need to understand the problem of water scarcity and where exactly the problem lies? Now to most of you, if I would ask this question, you would say definitely within India you have rain surplus areas and rain deficit areas. So let's say the arid and the semi-arid areas would have water deficiency. However, the areas of northeast, the areas of Indo-Gangetic Plain would be the areas of water surplus. But this is not the reality. You might be familiar with Cherapunji and Maisuram. These are the areas of heaviest rainfall. Despite of the fact you have Shillong, which is hardly 120 kilometers or near about from Cherapuji, still this place suffers from acute water shortages. Now, what is the reason for such shortage? Despite you have abundant rainfall in this region, you have areas where you have water shortage. Now, this is acute to the following reasons. First of all, over exploitation of the resources. Then you have excessive use of the resources. With growing urbanization and industrialization, you have more water that is used for the industrial and the urban activities. You have groundwater pumping devices that are established and this extracts the groundwater, creating gray zones in most of the areas. So most of the areas of Punjab, Haryana, Northern Rajasthan are facing kind of gray zone areas because the, the water table level has gone deep. That means you have the problem of water scarcity not only in the areas where you have rainfall deficit, but this also occurs in the area where you have abundant rainfall and that is mainly or predominantly due to human intervention. So you have large population, so since people are more, there is more demand for water, there is more uh, use in domestic and agricultural activities. All these account for scarcity of water even in the areas which are water abundant. Now Falkenmark was one of the pioneers who explained this in terms of water stress and he said if the water availability is less than 1000 cubic meters per person per day we call that as a water stress and if there is the water stress that remains for a prolonged period there would be phases of acute droughts and famines that could occur in a region. Now the next important thing 
that India has been leading is the multi-purpose river valley projects and the various integrated water resource management techniques. When we talk about multi-purpose river valley projects, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru called these as temples of modern India. That means they are not only, since the name suggests it's multi-purpose, they are not only providing water source, they are helping in irrigation and all the allied agricultural activities. We'll see later how it works. Let's first understand or work around a historical idea of how water management practices were done in India. If we talk on to the first century BC, prior to the first century BC, let's move on to the uh, various civilizations, the Harappa civilization and the Mohanjadara civilization. You had water tanks that were there and there was kind of water storage that used to take place. In the first century, you have the Sringaverampuram near Allahabad and this place was known for its unique water harvesting system and the water in this region was harvested or channelized from Ganga river. Then during the time of Chandragupta Maurya, there were numerous dams, lakes and irrigation systems that were built. Some of the pioneer examples of irrigation of the medieval and uh, ancient India are Kalinga in Odisha. Nagarjun Konda in Andhra Pradesh, you have Benur in Karnataka and Kolapur in Maharashtra. During the 11th century, Bhopal Lake was built and this is one of the largest artificial lake of its time. During the 14th century, there were tanks established in Hoskos, Delhi and this was done by Iltutmish when he was supplying water to the Siri Fort area. So these were some of the historical background uh, why and how water management practices started in India. Let's talk about the temples of modern India or the multipurpose projects. So the basic idea is to impound water, to store water. That water would be used to irrigate the fields. Besides irrigating, it would be used for hydroelectric power generation. It would provide water to the nearby areas for domestic agriculture and industrial use. It would help in controlling the flood by, the, by channelizing the excess water or storing or impounding it. It would also be, these areas would act as areas of recreation. It would provide inland navigation or boating and also near to the uh, multipurpose project, you would have fish breeding that could be practiced. Now here you have the diagram that shows a dam and you have the upstream area and the downstream area. So as you can see, there is a significant change in the gradient and because of this change in the gradient, when water moves down, you have hydroelectric energy that is generated and this is the head or the initial part of the dam and this is the toe. You have the spillaway that is, the, uh, that is located within the dam and through which the water comes to the downstream level. Now there are various types of dams which we can classify. Based on the height, we can say there are large dams, medium dams or small dams. Based on the material, there can be timber dams or embankments or masonry dams. Let's understand what are the basic limitation of damming an area. Now since you are creating a dam on a naturally flow, flowing river, what would happen? You would have immense water that would be stored in the upstream area and this water would be used in the nearby agricultural lands. Since you, you would be using ample of water, you would be growing water intensive crops like rice which could be grown in the regions close to the multi valley projects. Now since you are growing water intensive crops, what would happen? These regions would have the problems of sal salinization that would gain. Then again, most of the dams are between the borders of two states. So there are interstate disputes that starts up. You have excessive sedimentation that takes place at the bottom of the reservoir. Again, you are fragmenting the river stream into two. So you have the upstream and the downstream. So the migration of the aquatic flora, uh, aquatic flora and aquatic fauna becomes difficult. So you are artificially creating a boundary that is preventing the migration of animals or plants to and fro. Again, building a reservoir on the flood plains would lead to submergence of the, uh, the existing vegetation and it would lead to decomposition of the soil. So these are some of the primary uh, concerns that the region has. Besides this, since you are building such a huge infrastructure, 
It would lead to seismic imbalance, so there would be uh, uh, induction of earthquakes, so there could be chances of seismic disturbances in that area. Again, for building such a structure, you would have to displace the local people or the local tribals and communities. So those are again some of the prior concerns. So Narda Bachao Andolan and Tehri Dam Andolan are some of the uh, major examples where you have uh, kind of uh, revolt from the local people who are living there. Now here you have some of the major dams of India. Some of the important ones we will discuss. So one of those is Bhakra Nagal. It is considered as one of the gravity dams in India. So there are two dams, Bhakra and Nagal. These are amongst the highest dams of the world. Again, you have recently built the Heri Dam. It's one of the high, highest dam of India and among the highest dams of the world. On the Chambal project, you have three major dams. That's Rana Pratap Sagar, Kota Barrage and Gandhi Sagar. The order of these three dams are important. So from north, north to south, you have the following order. Again, Sardar Sarovar Dam on Narda is important. You have Nagarjun Sagar Dam. This dam basically divides or it's a kind of boundary between Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. It's based on one of the biggest rivers of the region, that's the Kaveri. Then you have Hirakon Dam that is located in Odisha. That's again important. Damodar Dam that is based on the Tennessee model of United States and Damodar was pre previously known as Sorrow of Bengal. So you have four dams that are built. So those are the Tilia, Methon, Panchet and Konar dams. And then you have the, uh, the Kosi dam, that's the Sorrow of Bihar. So you have uh, the dam on Kosi. Then you have the Gandak, Gandak dam. This Gandak dam is a kind of joint venture between India and Nepal. So these are some of the major dams that we have, the major multipurpose projects that we have discussed. Now what is the ironical situation here? The most ironical situation here is that these dams were predominantly built to control the problem of floods. However, with the building of dams, the problem of floods further aggravated. Because you are bounding the water to a limited area, so there is more problem of flood that is being induced. Again, in 2006, uh, in 2006 Gujarat and Maharashtra faced severe drought which led to devastation of pro property and a lot of soil erosion in the region. Sedimentation is another major concern as we discussed. So flood plains are deprived of the silt and again you have fertilizers that are being added and finally being washed off to the same water creating pollution in the water. We have already talked about the seismic activities that are induced in the region. Again, one of the important consequences is since you have the water that is being holded in that region, you have problems of waterborne diseases and pest infestation that occurs commonly in that region. Now what could be an alternative way of harvesting water? The best way to harvest water would be preserving the water that is naturally coming from the rainfall. rainfall. So there are various ways, one of the common ways that you might have heard of is the rooftop harvesting. Under a rooftop harvesting what happens, you try to collect the rain water that occurs, you just leave out the first rainfall and then collect the remaining water on the rooftop. This water passes through a pipeline into the tank and finally the extra water is supplied to an underground storage tank or we also call those as tankas in the common language. So these are some of the uh, basic water harvesting technique or most commonly used water harvesting techniques in the parts of dry areas mainly in the areas of Rajasthan. We also call this rain water as Pahalar Pani that's the pure, purest form of water that we can get. Again, this same mechanism as we talked about previously is now being used in Shillong because Shillong is facing acute water shortage as we talked uh, due to the over exploitation of the water resources. Again, there are other ways. For example, in the mountainous regions, what is happening is you have the diversion channels which are known as guls or kuls and these are commonly built to uh, divert the extra water. Again. In the flood plains of Bengal, you have indentation channels that are being built up and these channels irrigate the nearby field. In the arid and the semi-arid areas, you have 
what agricultural fields which are converted into water harvesting storage devices uh, storage structures they are commonly known as khadins in jaisalmer and johards in alwar this has been one of the major projects of rajendra singh under which he uh, runs an ngo and there are numerous johards that has been uh, made in that area and these are providing good agriculture to the farmers in the region because of rain water harvesting so predominantly you have rooftop harvesting that is common however in the areas of rajasthan with the construction of indira gandhi canal you have a diversion from rooftop harvesting to canal irrigation this canal irrigation further faced consequences of salinization and water logging issues that came up with the indira gandhi canal construction finally tamil nadu is the first and the only state in india to make rooftop harvesting systems compulsory for all the houses in the state now these are the rooftop harvesting systems that we have tried to explain there is one unique water harvesting system that is present in the parts of meghalaya that is known as the bamboo drip irrigation system so under this irrigation system you have the pieces of bamboo that are taken up and these pieces are connected one after the other from the ups up hills to the down hills and you have water that flows from this system and it's interesting to note you start with nearly 18 to 20 liters of the water when you start with the bamboo pipeline system and finally when it comes to the final stage you have nearly 20 to 80 drops per minute that are released it is a nearly 2000 years old technique that has been used by the local dwellers there with this technique fertilizers can be used with better efficiency it is a very low cost technique a kind of primitive technique with low operation cost low initial cost and low maintenance cost as well again weeds cannot absorb the water so there would be no issues of weed growing around in this system it would lead to maximum crop yield because it's again a kind of drop irrigation system again there is no nutrient loss or if if ever it is it is highly minimized so this would be a kind of very fruitful system even in the parts of rajasthan or the arid areas if it is practiced in a similar way so this was one of the major uh, uh, new irrigation system uh, not new new in terms of uh, its applicability to other regions so this is one of the major irrigation systems that we have discussed with this we cover the chapter on water resources we'll be covering the next chapter in the next lecture have a good day ahead